you go. All right, got two people. All right, that's great. Um, and before that, he worked with New Spring here in Anderson, was part of the uh, plant team uh, here in, and in Anderson, and uh, also uh, used to serve as FCA president at Clemson. I remember those days. I've known Dustin for a long time, and it's a, it's a great privilege to have him here with us. I've got one book, Life on Community, and I'm going to give this to a freshman on the front row, who the first one that can touch this, uh, this stage. There you go. Come get it. There you go. You got it. Awesome. Way to go. I didn't think anybody wanted it for a second there. I was, anybody? Well, no. It's a great book. Uh, last year, our theme in campus worship was Life on Community. This year, we're uh, Kingdom is Greater Than I, and Dustin is going to be speaking on the kingdom this morning. He's also co-authored a, a book, a great book uh, with a great study called Life on Mission. And, uh, and so that's, our, that's one that touches on a lot of our goals here at Anderson University. And uh, so we're real, real happy to have Dustin with us. He's going to be hanging around for uh, today and tomorrow, going to be speaking in some classes, and then he's going to be speaking tomorrow night at BCM. So I encourage you to come out for that. Uh, Josh Crocker has something coming up this weekend, um, something about a marriage, a wedding he's got to do. All right. Um, but uh, just no, uh, just you've seen some announcements on the slides going by uh, as we've come in. And uh, just want to draw your attention, there is a worship night tonight that Boulevards are sponsoring. Uh, it's going to be downtown Anderson, uh, Grounds for Grace, Grace and Grounds, that's what it is. And it's at Figs, and it'll be a great time for you to come out and be a part of that. So go downtown, get you some coffee, get you some ice cream, and uh, enjoy some fellowship there with that. Uh, just a reminder, guys, uh, you guys, last week, I just want to remind you, um, you know, when we come together for campus worship, it is a special time. That's the reason why we ask you to take your hats off when you come in, because this is a special time. It's a time when we come to meet with God. Uh, I've always told pe people, be glad, because in the Old Testament, when people met with God, he told them to take their shoes off. So, you know, we just ask you to take your hat off in reverence for God uh, in that way. And, uh, and we also ask you to turn off your cell phones, your iPads, no texting. Last week, you guys were awesome in here. You were very engaged in the message. You were paying attention. That's the kind of, we, we want you to do that. And we've got folks over in Daniel Recital Hall this morning. We've got folks in Merritt Theater this morning for Overflow. Uh, just so that you know, we won't be doing that all through the semester as the numbers begin to kind of dwindle down as people start getting their credits and start, you know, having exams and all that good stuff on Wednesdays and the crowd starts dropping. We, we hope to shut those down, but for right now, we do have both locations today. And so uh, you guys in Henderson, let's do a real shout out to the people in Daniel and Merritt real quick. Say hey to them. Yeah, they just want you to know that they're there and, uh, and we know you're there. And so we're, we're glad that you're a part of what we're doing in campus worship. One campus worshiping one God. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for just a great day to come before you. God, thank you for just a little bit of the, the change in the, the temperature, um, bringing about fall. Lord, it reminds us that you are the God of all creation, that you are the creator God who, uh, who is in charge of the seasons and the days of our lives. And you have brought us here at this place, at this time, to know you for your glory. And Father, as... Uh, as uh, Dustin has written in his book about life and community. Lord, the challenge to live our lives in community of brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, it also is a challenge to us this morning to, to understand that we live in your kingdom and your kingdom reigns and will reign for all eternity. Lord, I pray that you would be with Dustin this morning. I pray that you would help us as we worship you. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our lives to draw us closer and closer to you that we may be about your good and your work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you'll stand with us, let's be worshiped.
safe in the God who never moves, holding fast to the promise of the truth that you hold inside it still to me. The rock won't move and his word is shown. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock won't move and his word is shown.
that's never changing. We thank you so much for that. We thank you that even in our darkest moments, you still loved us and you gave your son for us in love. We thank you that through the cross, we can have joy and peace and salvation. We thank you so much for the love that was displayed for us on the cross. And I just pray that we will never lose sight of that. I pray that now as we transition into this time, our minds will just be open to the word and that we will be receptive to what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. summer I went with Jen Sen to New York City. Hello, my name is Ashley Boltman and I spent six weeks in New York City with the Jen Sen program and got to live life on mission specifically on County Island. Uh, Jen Sen is an initiative that the North American Mission Board has to send out college students to different cities, uh, major urban centers all over North America. We were designated specifically in the borough of Brooklyn and every team was designated a specific neighborhood to spend time, build relationships, um, get to prepare information for future church planners. And at the end of the six weeks, we created a prospectus. And it really has kind of two purposes, two things that we did while we were there. One of those is to discover how we can engage in the mission of God through the local church. Uh, so we do that through a lot of different ways like you know, demographics and things like that. But the biggest way that we do that is through developing relationships with people who are in the community, uh, figuring out what their experiences are with church, with Christianity, uh, and figuring out um, the culture that's there so that we can communicate the gospel in a way that connects with the culture. Uh, the second thing that Jen Send is for is, is to help us to engage the people that are there in that context uh, personally through building relationships with them so that we can evangelize uh, in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Something that's really great about the culture of New York City is it's the most diverse place in the world, it's the most dense place in the world, but everyone there is very lonely. Um, whenever you walk onto the subway, everyone just has dead eyes and blank stares. Um, but if you take the time to engage in conversation with them, they are willing to open up so much about their lives. So um, one quick story is one time I sat on a subway and there was a man to my right and a woman to my left. and the man on my right was was reading a Jehovah's Witness book and we got to talk a lot about him searching for truth in a lot of different areas of life, whether that was in the Quran or the Bible um, or the Book of Mormon. And he got off the train and the woman to my left asked, what are you guys talking about? And she told me that she was Muslim and um, we started talking about Ramadan and what it looks like to be a woman and um, practicing the faith of Islam. And that's just a picture of New York City. The darkness is that close and everyone around needs to hear the gospel. And it's the simple things like being on a subway um, where you can talk about the kingdom of God. Life on Mission uh, is it's about engaging the gospel in your daily relationships and things that you do every day. Uh, it's about leveraging the influence that you have with people and all the gifts and the abilities, the passions that you have with a gospel intentionality, using those things to build up the kingdom of God and to further the gospel in any way that you can. It's a way of living that is self-abandoned. It's a way of living that focuses more on how can I further the kingdom of God than how can I live life apathetically or, or how can I live a life that just meets my needs or accomplishes my goals. It's, it's a life that is surrendered and sacrificed to the mission of God in the world. I learned that um, serving Jesus and having gospel conversations can be done in the simplest of ways. So while we were on, we're on Coney Island, we went to the YMCA and befriended trainers, we went to the local library and sat in on classes, we worked at the local park to hand out free meals, and in all of those very simple ways we found um, opportunities to talk about Jesus. So, for example, one of the trainers that we met he was teaching us how to work out and we ended up sitting down in the middle of the floor and having a gospel conversation about where we can find our hope in dark situations. And I definitely learned that living missionally and living a kingdom life isn't something extravagant. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to be super holy or Christian, that loving Jesus well just means sharing the love of Christ in the simplest way. Uh, living a life on mission isn't something that people who are 
pastors do. It's something that the entire church does. It's a call um, that God has given to every believer, every disciple. There's no such thing as a disciple who doesn't make more disciples. So this should be the goal and the focus of every Christian's life. It's not something that people who are just in ministry do. Um, and so we ought to be more focused on the whole church, not just church leaders uh, and clergy people. Uh, we have to focus on the whole church coming together to make disciples in the world and advance the kingdom of God. I think the kingdom of God is knowing that there's hope for the future, that there's going to be a restored world, and bringing that justice and that grace and that mercy here on the king in this earthly kingdom. So the true answer to all the brokenness that's around you is found in Jesus, and not necessarily just me giving you a free lunch, but me giving you an opportunity to hear about the the greatest blessing of all, which is Jesus Christ. All right, everybody doing okay? <laughs> Fantastic. About as many people that came to my church uh, are doing well. Uh, what y'all didn't know about that book is inside that book was a $100 bill. I'm totally kidding. Uh, that's not true at all. I apologize. I'll, I'll buy you coffee over there. Uh, low budget these years. Um, so, man, this is awesome to be here. Um, I'm Dustin. I live in Atlanta. I used to live in Anderson at one point uh, for about two years, and then I lived in Columbia, South Carolina for seven. Uh, I'm planning and pastor of Midtown Fellowship there, which apparently two people go to, so that's good. Uh, and, then, and then from there, I uh, moved to Atlanta. I work with the North American Mission Board, and uh, just privileged to get to travel and speak and write things, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it's fun. I am married, and I have two kids. Uh, my son's name is Jack, and my daughter's name is Piper. I think we have a picture of them. Don't they look adorable? Uh, so, I, they're good looking. Like, they're good looking kids. They don't look like, they look like my wife. So that's really good. Uh, but, so those are my kids. They're so much fun. Um, this morning, uh, my son lately has been traveling with me when I speak. And uh, he's got school today, so he couldn't come. And he told me though recently, he said, Daddy, you know, this is, uh, this is all gonna end soon. I was like, what? He's like, me traveling with you to speak. And I was like, well, I, we just started. Like, you just started traveling? He's like, yeah, but soon you'll be traveling with me while I speak. Um, <laughs> like, all right. And to quote, he said, you can carry my Bible. <laughs> so, that's great. Hey, if I did that for the rest of my life, that'd be awesome. I'll carry my son's Bible and let him preach. My daughter, on the other hand, has never told me uh, that she wanted to uh, do anything for the most part related to the Lord. Um, she is very different than my son. Um, but she was singing the other day. She loves singing. She was singing a song about God the other day, which was like an inspiring moment. Um, and she was singing that God is so big. He's so strong. He's so mighty. There's nothing that our God cannot do. And I'm thinking, man, this is awesome. Look at this. We, all those times that we do the Bible, Jesus, uh, you know, Bible at night, she's like, she's getting something because she's just her own. Like she does, thinks, whatever she wants, she does. So I'm thinking, okay, this is great. She's grasping this with this. Later on, she's like, I want to sing a sad song now, Daddy. I was like, all right, you sing a sad song. And so in a joyful little smile like you see, she said, everybody's going to die. <laughs> no one will live. <laughs> then she said, it's a sad, sad day in our neighborhood. I don't know. So, so then, so then, so my son's going to preach to my daughter, hopefully. Um, so then, the other day, her and my son Jack kind of get into it, and uh, he knows not to hit his sister. She's going all out. I mean, she's, she's not the girl who, like, does this. I mean, it's just all out, head down. She's swinging. She's grabbing for hair. She's doing whatever she can to fight him, and he's just like, Dad, stop her. So I go, and I grab her hands, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm like, arresting her. I put them behind her back, kind of, hey, you can't do that to him. She goes, bam, and headbutts him square in the nose. <laughs> Ridiculous. So, I'll quit talking about her soon because uh, she's the grace of God. Hopefully, will ascend or descend onto her. Um, and then, 
to top it all, I mean, you see her, right? Like, she's adorable. She, she gets away with everything. Not with me. Not with me. A lot of people are like, oh, she's got your... No, she doesn't. I am after her. I'm going to change her one way or another. <laughs> a little boy is at our house the other day, and he won't pay attention to her. It was one of my son's friends who's older than her. And she looks at him, and she goes, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And she's just like, pay attention to me. And I was like, Piper, chill out. You got to speak more nicely to him. And she says, okay. And she goes, Luke, watch me, watch me. And uh, <laughs> I was like, so I have another picture of her that describes her better. That's her. Um, that's, that's my daughter. Uh, now on the same watch me, watch me stanky leg day, uh, she said, cause she, 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 she does the deal. Uh, but here's, here's what's cool. I'm, I, and yeah, yeah, okay, good. It's off. Um, but later that night, and it's just so cool to watch God work, uh, actually working in my daughter who's three and a half, working in my son who's six. Later the night, she says to me, daddy, I want, in light of the, you know, talking about everyone's dying and dead, she said, I want everybody to know Jesus. I said, why? She, I said, why do you want everybody to know Jesus? She said, he's so good. He's so good. And it, there's something about that childlike faith that for me, I'm going, that's, that's exactly right. I want people in New York City to know Jesus because he's just so good. I mean, Jesus changes everything. He does. And so my prayer for my kids is that they would leverage their lives wherever God takes them. I'm not praying, oh, I hope they're a pastor. Oh, I hope they're uh, a worship leader. I'm just praying whatever God calls them to do, whatever the calling on their life is, whether that's to be an engineer or a nurse or a barista, whatever it may be, that they would leverage their life for our good God and the expansion of his good kingdom. Honestly, that, that's my prayer for them, but that's my, that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me, that I would leverage my life wherever I am, what, wherever God takes me, that I would leverage my life for our God's good kingdom. And so Paul, in Colossians chapter 4, delivers, if you have a Bible, you can turn there, Colossians chapter 4, delivers this extremely uh, clear instruction, really on what a kingdom builder does and the background to this passage, the background to getting to Colossians 4 is incredible. And so I'm actually not going to teach all of Colossians 4 right now. I'm, I'm going to read it, and then I want to teach from the background that gets us to Colossians 4. And then in BCM tomorrow night, I'll actually teach this passage. So this is like the intro, and then tomorrow night we'll dig into it a little bit deeper. So Colossians 4, let's read verses 2 through 6. It says, Continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Then he gives this encouragement to the church. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul is giving this incredible encouragement to this local church. I mean, he basically in that passage says, pray, be thankful, pray for open doors, which is interesting for him in that moment. He's saying, pray that we together collectively would have open doors. He's in prison. Like, Think about that. I'm going, what? He's praying for open doors to share the gospel. I'm, Lord, I'm praying for the doors to open, literally. I would like to leave this prison. But Paul is saying, no, just pray for open doors to share the truth of the gospel, speaking the gospel in a clear way. It says, be wise with non Christian. Use your time with them wisely. Be gracious in what you say. But season with salt. Don't be afraid to speak the truth and give answers to those people with the gospel which changes people. So you have this incredible church receiving these instructions about sharing the gospel in a clear way. And we'll talk about that tomorrow night at BCM. But I wanna ask a rhetorical question. Just think to yourself. And I think this question, and as we follow it, will speak volumes to us and to this room. Who started the church at Colossae. 
Who started that church? Some people may spat out quickly, well, it was Paul, or you know, it was, it was this other person. It was the, who it was one of the apostles? Who, who started it? Well, if you go and you look in your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 1. You just flip back a few, uh, few chapters. Colossians 1, let me read verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at the church at Colossae, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father. We always thank you. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed the whole world in its bearing fruit and increasing, as it is also among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved servant. So Epaphras is our God. You go back and you look at most likely, high percentage, most scholars would tell us Epaphras was the one who taught at this church. He probably started and planted this church. And then if you look at verses 21 and 27, what you'll see is in verses 21 and 27, this was a Gentile church. So not only has Epaphras gone out, shared the gospel, won people to Christ, and is now teaching what is a very influential church in this region of what today is Turkey, he is doing it among people who had no access to the gospel. Epaphras started this church in Colossae. So what, it, what do we know about him? Honestly, we don't know a lot. We know he had a relationship with Paul, and there's even a good chance that Paul being Paul, discipled him, poured into him, maybe shared the gospel with him for the first time. We don't know that to be a fact, but we know that they were together in Rome in AD 57. And so Paul is the one who reached out to this guy, poured gospel into him in some form, some fashion. This guy then goes to this place in Colossae, very influential city in what is modern day Turkey, and he plants this church in and among a people who don't have and have not had access to the gospel. So the church of Colossae was started by a guy who was discipled by Paul. But now, let's do a little bit more background work. Who sent Paul out? So if Paul's the one that goes to Epaphras, Epaphras is the one that starts the church, who sent Paul out? Look at Acts chapter 13, verses 2 through 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, who we know, by the way, is Paul, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. What do we know about the church at Antioch? The church at Antioch was the greatest church planting church in the history of the first century. Like, we can't sit back apathetically now and just go, well, that's great. I'm really glad that uh, the uh, church in Antioch started. It's fantastic. No, that's, that's how the gospel got to you. That's how it got to me. Like, they began this movement towards the gospel going to a Gentile world. They planted more churches than anybody. Like, for crying out loud, they sent Paul out to plant churches. Like, that's a good day. Like, if your church is expanding and starting campuses here, campuses there, or planting a church over here, planting a church over there, it's like, uh, who we got up next to go start that new campus? Oh, Paul. The Apostle Paul. That'll work. See how he does. This is an incredible church. I mean, this is the church that sent Paul out to an unreached Gentile world. But let's take it a step further. Who started the church at Antioch? So if you have this church that sends Paul out, who started that church? What was his name? Anybody? What was the name of the band that led worship at that church? Here's what we know. It wasn't the apostles. Matter of fact, most scholars, particularly David Platt says that it was nameless, faithful followers of Christ, most likely farmers. So just follow me here for a second. Who started this church? Regular, ordinary people who have jobs. Nothing against, hey, how many people in here Christian ministry majors? Raise your hand. All right, very cool. How many of you are not Christian ministry majors? Raise your hand. All right, there you go, put them down. So Christian ministry majors, you didn't get to plant the church at Antioch. 
It was all the other people who raised their hand. It was, it was what today would be lawyers and stay-at-home moms and FedEx workers and engineers and graphic artists and farmers and CEOs. And the list goes on of people who are sitting within the seats at this university right now. You will go and you will get a job somewhere in some city. Those are the people who started the most influential church in the first century. Let me just say, when you look at a place like New York City, you look at the density and diversity of the population there, we don't have enough Christian ministry majors here to do that. There are not enough Christian ministry majors in every college and every seminary across North America to do that in New York City. If we're going to see a sustainable, real move of God, it will not be because we have just better bands and great people who can stand up and speak. I'm for those things. I think those are a really good thing. But if we're going to see a real move of God, it will be on the backs of everyday people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, faithfully joining God in his mission to build his kingdom. It will be on the backs of those people. And the good news is this. One more time. How many of you are not Christian ministry majors? Raise your hand. The good news is there's plenty of you to do it. There's plenty of you in this room to see a real move of God. We need everyday missionaries. We need kingdom builders, those who practice life on mission where God has placed them, whether that is in an office complex, a third world country, or a college campus. There is no such thing as an unsent Christian. There's not. One of the the folks in the video said that. It's it's not just for the select few, it's for those who are in Christ. And what I love that's happening right now is like a really good friend of mine who is in real estate development in Atlanta. I mean, the dude is loaded. Uh, But he feels like God has taught him so much through the real estate business, he's begun to share the gospel with those that he works with in that industry. I mean, one of the leading real estate developers in the entire Atlanta area. And so this past week, he spent the entire week in Southeast Asia, and he's working with local people there to help with some real estate development in this area where uh, unbelievable possibilities for uh, financial growth for the local people, but he's doing it. And so he's decided he's actually just going to go ahead and move there, leverage the fact that he has this incredible platform and use that to share the gospel in a place that, by the way, would be illegal for a missionary to go to. But yet the government there is going to pay him. The government's going to pay him to come there. God's got the whole thing rigged. We got governments who won't let missionaries in that are paying for missionaries to come there. It's unbelievable. Do you know there's certain places in New York City where when you go to live there, they, uh, the people in that building literally decide if you can live there or not. And I've seen where some people are like, well, I, I'm a pastor, I'm planting a church. And they're like, oh, great, that's awesome. You can't live here. It's like me when I get on a plane, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, cool. Check out my beats. Uh, and they put their headphones on and the conversation's over. So I started, I, I work around that now. I'm a writer. They're like, oh, really? What do you write? Oh, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> if we're going to see a move of God, it's going to be because engineers moved to New York City and people who are in finance moved to New York City and people moved to Southeast Asia who can help land developers in that country be paid by that country to share the gospel with that country. That's how we're going to see a real move of God. It's like the stay-at-home mom in her neighborhood right now who she felt led that the Lord, she was a nurse for a number of years, and she actually at some point was a nurse here in Anderson, and felt the Lord was leading her to be a mom, but not for the sake of just being at home with her kids, but for the sake of she knows that there's so many moms that go and hang out at breakfast at Chick-fil-A and other places, and she feels like that's her mission field. So she had a book club uh, just two weeks ago uh, in reading, which uh, to me is like, are you kidding me? Uh, Reading To Kill a Mockingbird. There was a reason there were cliff notes for that book. Uh, And so she is now Leveraging her life in that way, there were 18 women in that home the other night. Out of those 18, 15 completely lost from the gospel. No clue. 
One of those women, she's been building a relationship for a while, and recently the, uh, the lady looked at her and said, hey, I just want to tell you, uh, I see how you live, I see how your family is, I see what the Lord is doing uh, in you, but I don't even know the Lord, so I'm not sure if I should even reference him right now, but um, I don't know if this is what you're supposed to do, because I've never been in the church, and you know I'm not a Christian, but do you think we could get together for like two hours every week and just read the Bible together and you explain it? Like, yeah, I think we could probably work that out. <laughs> like, this is a mom who sees, and then across the street from her is a lady who's Wiccan. She's invited her into her home for years. And the lady's like, no, 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 no. Finally, all of a sudden, the lady goes, hey, um, I'd love to come to the community group where you guys study and read the Bible together uh, on Sunday afternoons, if that's okay. She's like, yeah, but you're Wiccan. <laughs> you sure? Like she tests her, are you sure? She's like, yes, because I've seen something in you and the way you just care for the ladies in this neighborhood that I feel like, uh, I feel like what you believe is genuine, so I'm, I'm up to exploring it. What? How does that happen? How do governments pay for people? How do stay-at-home moms have favor in that way? How does the Lord do that with a real estate agent friend of mine, also in Atlanta, where the Lord is working in and through his company and his business. How does the Lord do that? What is going on? Is it just because these people are impressive? No, it's because the Holy Spirit's still real. You know what the Holy Spirit does? Draws people to himself. But what's our calling? To be like the people, the kingdom builders who started Antioch. To live intentionally where God has placed us, to share the gospel where we are, and to watch God move and work. What does that look like practically? We'll talk about that tomorrow night. So we'll just build this on the screen in conclusion. So what have, we, what have we started with? Let's look at the timeline. It's a bunch of everyday kingdom builders. A bunch of everyday kingdom builders who, just farmers living out in Antioch, and they begin to meet, and people come to Christ, and this church starts. And then from there, you follow the timeline, and who do they send out? So now Paul. You continue going, and you'll see that they, uh, the church of Antioch starts from them. They send out Paul. Paul then meets a guy by the name of Epaphras. And Epaphras then starts the church of Colossae. Like, do you see this? Here's my hope. This is going to happen in Southeast Asia with my good friend. This is going to happen in and through a stay-at-home mom in a neighborhood. In a community group that she's a part of that her and her husband lead, lead. there are 45 people in their home. Majority not Christian. And what are they doing? They're eating together around the table and opening the word of God and watching the Holy Spirit does what the, do what the Holy Spirit does. Draw people in. And what's the encouragement to all of us in that? Colossians 4. This church gets this encouragement back, this letter. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to make to declare the mystery of Christ on account for which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, season with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Listen, building the kingdom is not necessarily about going to a specific place. God may call you to do that, and you go. But it is about being intentional wherever you are whether that is New York City, Southeast Asia, or the suburbs of Atlanta, or Anderson University. The calling on our lives, I'm all for Christian ministry majors. I, I got a master's degree in, in uh, this theology studies, and so I, I'm for those things. But I'm just telling you, if we're going to see a real move of God, it will not just because, be because Christian ministry majors go and start churches. I pray for that. But it'll be because they go and start churches with nurses and lawyers and teachers and baristas all around them proclaiming the gospel where they are. That's how we see a move of God. That's what we saw in Acts. And the Holy Spirit is still the same today. So let's see what's possible. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a room full of influencers. Lord, thank you for a room full of people who are going to go out and get jobs. Lord, I pray that they would do it strategically for your name. But Lord, I, I pray that they wouldn't wait to live on mission until they get to that place or that city or that new job or 
But Lord, that it would begin even now, that the practice would start right now where they are in this place. Lord, that you'd remind us it's not necessarily about where we're going, but it's about being intentional wherever we are. That we'd understand that we as followers of Christ Jesus are a sent people to live out the mission of God. Lord, we not rely on just a Sunday church service to save the world, but Lord, we would see that it makes so much more sense for us to be spread out sharing the gospel the same way, Lord, that you did in and through Acts. I pray for that now. I pray for a movement in and through the people in this room. And that we would look back and tell stories of those who went from here to places and to cities and that cities were literally changed. Because that's what you can do. We believe in the power of your Holy Spirit to work, to draw people to yourself. Use us in that. Lord, it's by your grace that we get to be involved. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you guys to stand and sing with us.
for coming out to campus worship. You guys are dismissed.